Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Stan Steele podcast. I am your host, Stan Steele. Um, now, before we get going, I want to take this time to give thanks to the Most High for making this podcast a reality, among many other things in my life. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, people have been asking me, you know, what exactly uh, is your podcast about? So my podcast will feature guests um, from all different walks of life. And um, some of my guests may have higher public profiles than others, but my goal is to bring you a wide array of guests from many different backgrounds and areas of expertise. I hope you find the content informative as well as fun. And um, I will be putting up a new podcast every two weeks so you can subscribe to the channel uh, to see when new content uh, is available to you. Also, I want to take a minute to give a shout out to my tech advisor, Aaron, my editor, Zeke, and my cousin, Audrey, you know, for all their assistance. Thank you guys for all of your help. So let's not wait another second. I want to introduce to you my very first guest ever on the Stan Steel podcast. She is the highly sophisticated, multi-talented WNBA pioneer and legend, I bring to you today, Miss Kim Hampton. How you doing, Kim? I'm great. How are you? Oh, man, I'm hanging in there. You know, I'm doing all right. You know, thank God I'm okay. Awesome. Okay, okay. Everything good with you? Family? Everybody's well? Yeah, everything's good. I just literally spoke to my daughter uh, right before I, you know, I just got on, logged on. She's doing good. She's starting her sophomore year awesome. uh, college at the University of Cincinnati. And, um, you know, so we were just kind of chopping it up a little bit. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. That's cool. So the league, the WNBA has been around 25 plus years. You know, I see no signs of it slowing down. In what ways are the current athletes um, styles or ways of playing similar to or different than, you know, compared to players that came before them? What, what do you see out there? Well, I see that, you know, players have evolved. Uh, players have gotten better. Players do things with a lot more ease. Um, I feel that uh, just the skill set overall has just completely improved. And that's just across the board, basketball in general. Okay. That's pretty cool. Oh, that's nice. Okay. So, all right. So based on that, then, what conclusions can you draw about the future of the WNBA? Well, I mean, if I had to just say, I think that it's only going to grow stronger and get bigger and get better. And uh, I think it's going to expand and we're going to get some, some more teams because there's just... You know, too many there, you know, there are 12 teams right now, there are 11 players on the roster, and there are just too many great players in the world for it not to grow and expand. Okay, so how do you think the league is going to be able to, you know, attract those players? How, how do you think they're going to go about doing that? It's not about attracting the players. The players are already out there. It's about the leagues deciding to draw, I mean, deciding to, to draft the players. But it's, it's, it's about the league, again, expanding or them expanding the roster space. So that's that's what it boils down to. If the oh, league so, staying, expand, you get more teams. You get 12, 13, 14 teams, and that opens up and gives more jobs, more opportunities. Or if you expand the roster space, for example, you have 13 players and 11. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. So, okay. That, okay. So now in terms of, all right. So I noticed with the NBA over the years, right? I've been watching the, the NBA since 1979. That's when I first started watching. And, you know, I see how the league evolved and, you know, they got different personalities and, you know, athletes that people want it to be. Um, do you think that's a wise strategy for the WNBA to you to get players that kids want to be, you know, or model themselves after? Well, I don't think that, you know, when you're recruiting athletes, when you're drafting athletes, you're not, I mean, I don't, I think the basketball, the skill set, the mentality, um, and, and yeah, the temperament of players, I, I think all of that is taken into perspective, but I don't think that I don't think teams draft players based off of do you think our fan base, our audience, the kids are going to want to be like that person. You know, I mean, oh. it's just like every time, ahead, you talk, 
Yeah, every time you put on a jersey and you go out and you play, I think that the way you play um, speaks for itself. And I think that is what generates people or players or kids wanting to be like you, you know, things like that. So I don't, I don't think the league, you know, like teams specifically, that, you know, go after players for those attributes. Okay, so okay, so let's say you got a, a superstar, right? Somebody you know that stands out above everyone else. Um, do you think the league uses their talent to draw more fans? Because I noticed um, with the addition of um, a couple of players to the Liberty this year, you know the attendance is up at Barclays Center. I've been seeing that. And um, go ahead, I'm sorry. You know, yeah, what I'm saying is, is anytime you win or anytime you get great players on your roster, which could produce the, the potential to win, yeah, you're going to get more fans, especially if you're winning. And so the Liberty, uh, you know, they are definitely having a great season. Um, and, you know, they're still and they're continuing to grow and to get better because the playoffs will be starting pretty soon. Um, you know, so they still have a little ways to go and things to work on. So, yeah, all of that definitely helps. But bottom line is winning you know if you if you're winning you know if you're gonna draw fans you're gonna have a fan base oh, gonna, like the know. aces i saw the aces they won it this year and um did they have the all-star game out there this year too as well last year yeah and then they have the all-star game yeah yeah, I, I watched that, I, and um, it started to look a lot like the NBA's All Star Game, with you know celebrities coming in and sitting on courtside and all of that stuff. So sometimes, you know, in my opinion, I think that makes the game more appealing when they see, you know, movie stars and actors and politicians at the games and things like that. So, okay, I think it does too. But my point is, is if you go into a basketball game, you're not really going to see, you know, the courtside row, you know. Again, I think that's where, that's one of the hurdles that women's basketball has to overcome. You know, we still have to overcome, you know, okay, what what's going to bring you out when, you know, you go to an NBA game because you want to go to the players play. So, um, you know, so again, yeah, it, I think it does. It definitely helps everything to have celebrities in the house but i would like to think of it as not just the celebrities having the celebrities come in the house i think it's the celebrities wanting to be in the house because they see how great the game is they see how great these players are so i think it's coming from that perspective and that people you know and celebrities and more people are really starting to really see that women can play this game like whoa yeah absolutely i, I agree with that I agree with that. Continue. I'm sorry. Go ahead. How is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, I was um was listening to something that um Spike Lee had said a few years back. I forget who was at one of the games. Somebody in music. I forget who it was. But he was like, "Oh yeah, you know, he's a fan now." You know. But let me go on back to your point. Yes, um, the women can ball, absolutely. And um, I coach girls basketball and I see, you know, they are getting better. And, you know, the game is played. The only thing I don't like about the WNBA, I don't like the ball itself, that orange and white ball. I wish they would just use uh, a, a one color ball. I don't know why that bothers me. But in terms of their skills, yes, they can absolutely play, you know. now. How would you describe the sequence of events necessary to succeed, not just in the WNBA, but in anything a young person wanted to, uh, you know, do with his or her life? Well, I think that they have to, number one, decide what it is that they want to do with their lives. I feel like we've all been blessed with our own natural talents, gifts and talents. Like, you know, you might be great with numbers. You know, some people are just naturally athletic. Some people can just naturally sing or dance. Or some people just have a natural knack to cook. Some people just have a level of creativity. So we all have our gifts and talents. But I really just feel like finding out what you want to do, then going after that. Like really, like if, if you're going to be an athlete, like really, you know, like deciding on a sport or playing different sports until you decide and you kind of you're able to localize, um, you know, whatever sport that is that you want to focus on. 
And then just putting the work in. I think putting the work in um, on and off the court. I'm just going to do basketball as my example. On and off the court. Um, finding, becoming a student of the game. Finding um, out how and what makes the great players great. You know, things like that. I, I just think um, you have to immerse yourself and you have to put the work in. You just have to immerse yourself in all of that. I think sometimes too, you know, I'm around young people and um and adults too. I know adults, I know grown folks right now as we speak that, you know, sometimes people have trouble finding, you know, what it is or their niche, if you will, you know, in terms of what exactly they want to do, you know, as it relates to their life. So, you know, for some people, I I think it gets shown to them earlier in life than others. And you know, I guess that's a case by case um, situation because sometimes people don't know what they want to do, you know, and they may get into something. And then after they get into it, like I knew a guy, he studied to be a coroner, right? He went to school, he did all the work, he put in the work and he got on his coroner job. And after about maybe five months or so, he was like, I don't want to do this after he did all of that work. So that's something, you know, you got to look out for as well. Ben, you about to say something? Well, you know, I, I think, I think we're all shown signs early on of what our gifts are. Um, I mean, I, I realized early on that I was an athlete. I didn't start participating in organized sports until my freshman year of high school. But when we were playing with the kids on the street, and we were playing tag and running relay races and playing kickball, like I stood out. Like I was like, you know, I was I was an athlete. And so, and then I always loved to sing. And I would sing around the house and you know, my- Oh yeah, I wanna hear about that. I definitely wanna hear about that. Yeah, my family would be like, you know, Kim sing this. So I believe that we are all shown our signs at an early age. Now, mm -hmm. based off of our, our environment and our, and our upbringing, if those, if, if I believe that sometimes if those gifts and talents are supported, um, you know, early on and nurtured, like if your if your parents put you in a position to sing, or if your parents, if you want to, you know, if you love drawing, if your parents put you in drawing classes, you know, and things like that, if those are acknowledged and, and nurtured, then I think kids have more of a chance to do it a lot more. But if they're just kind of left alone you know as you get older um you know with kids you just have so many choices and then you go into you know like your pre-teenage and teenage age and you're just kind of trying to fit in and be cool so now you're probably not going to want to try you know like i'm not going to just start singing now you know that's going to laugh at me and everybody's gonna you know so i think it, it starts early you know? but i do believe that we're exposed to our, our gifts you know at an early age yeah I, I agree with that and i think that um you're right. You know, the situation, like for me, myself, right? I was a good runner. I didn't know how good a runner I was, you know? So I didn't pursue running because, you know, I, I could run. Like every time we were doing stuff, you know, I could run. I was always ahead of the pack, you know? And I could run for a long time, but I didn't realize that, you know, you could have actually have ran track. You know, I did not know that. So. You know, my mom and dad, you know, may they rest in peace. They were um, heavy into, you know, you hitting the books and academics and things like that because they, they, they kind of viewed athletics as a long shot, you know, and that's the way they viewed it. And that's how, you know, we had to go about following what they said. So it, it was fine, you know. And that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. And especially if you come from a family that was non-athletic. You know, then, then you, um, you know, that, that makes it, you know, really hard because they're not going to push you into something that they have no knowledge of and that, you know, they don't understand that. Like you said, their main focus was education. And so they'll push you there. But if you had any extracurricular activity or gifts, if they, if, if, if that language didn't, if, if, if your gifts and talents didn't speak loud enough to them, then they probably weren't going to pour into them. And so kids like you, you miss out. You know? My brothers as well. My Both my brothers were very, very good athletes as well. They were very good athletes. But, you know, like we said, you know, I, I don't think 
that was a mission priority for my parents. So, you know, that's that's how they were, and that's fine, you know. Also, I, I saw you singing the other night. T tell me about this singing business. How how did you get into it? Uh, you got any dates coming up? Where, where can we see you play? Um, I um, I started singing when I was a kid, and I used to always love. I think that was probably my first love. Uh, okay, I was super shy. I'm sorry. Let me let me stop you one second. You said just when you was a kid. I, I saw you singing recently. Wasn't that, was that not you? You asked me how did that start, and I'm trying to. Oh, you. okay, okay, got it. Okay, tell me about that. Where are you gonna be? How did that start? And so I'm just telling you that you know, as a kid, I, I started singing, and um, and I realized at an early age that I could carry a tune, and so my parents <laughs> really want me to sing, and uh -huh. um, you know, and stuff like that. But I was really, really shy. So when athletics took over, it kind of took a back burner because I was super shy. So I really wasn't trying to sing in front of people and things like that. But when the WNBA started, I realized there's a platform to um, really start pushing this. And I knew I couldn't play basketball forever. So I just started <laughs> going to karaoke, believe it or not, just to get my stage bearing, just to start you know working on that stage fright and things like that and so uh, then it just started happening and then in new york i just started booking gigs and you know singing i, I was singing with this choir uh you know and so i just started singing more and more, more. so now you know I'm, I'm just i'm usually i'm singing more jazz than anything mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah it's just so, it's a love and a passion that i have and it's just, and i'm just like why not you know like it was a gift that i was blessed with and uh, it's not like I'm trying to be Beyonce, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I really feel like uh, you know that there's, you know, there's a place for me here. So. Okay. When, when when you were in the city, um, what what club were you playing in? Um, I would I would do uh, stuff at the Sugar Bar. I, I've I've done the Blue Note and I've done Birdland. And um, you know, and just just other you know various other places just here and there, you know. So speaking of jazz, I met the inventor of the solo jazz album a few years back. This guy named uh, George Avaki, and he's he's deceased now. I think he made it to about a hundred years old. But he's the he's the guy that signed um, Miles Davis to his uh, solo deal. Wow. Yeah, and he used to be down at Birdland quite a bit. You know, he was into he was into the jazz scene heavy, but he went from taking, you know, the the big band jazz to you know individual artist jazz recordings, which was pretty cool. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, he was a he was a great guy, George. Yeah, he was a great guy, and um, he he uh, explained a lot to me about different artists, and he he was funny. He was a great guy. When I used to do uh rehab therapy. He was uh, one of the patients there, you know. So that that's that was pretty cool. So let me ask you this now: um, Do you think you would involve yourself uh, in the league in terms of like front office work or things of that nature? Uh, I mean, you never say never, but I don't know. I mean, like not this stage of the game, and then. I'm more of a people person. Uh, I like I like dealing more with people, not so much as an office stuff. So what? Well, okay, go ahead. No, yeah, I just yeah. What about coaching? Um, no. Never. Why I don't have to be a coach. Never. Why not? I'm just curious. Why not? Well, I, I believe that you have to have a certain level of patience with that, and I realized my love for X's and O's and the day in and day out stuff like, you know, the disciplinary part, you know, just getting kids to focus and lock in, you know, like that, that's, that's just not me. It, it, you know, I, I understand that my patience level for that, like if you come to practice, I want you to be locked in. I want you to give your all. I want you to, you know, and stuff. And, yeah, and I didn't even like practice as a player. I mean, I practiced because I knew I had to, but just to go every day and be in a gym and practice, ugh, yeah, that just definitely wasn't. But, but who I am is 
I really feel like I'm really good. Like I see people. And what I mean by I see people, I see people like when they're not feeling confident or they're feeling upset or angry or they're feeling a particular way. And I think that I have a gift to say things that people need to hear. Um, you know, like when I talk and speak to kids, for example, I'll have kids, a team, I'll go and speak to a team and I'll have kids raise their hand and I say, okay, where are my starters at? You know, who starts? And so, you know, of course you get the five starters, you know, okay, who's the first people coming off the bench, you know, and then the next year I say, where are the players that play maybe a little bit, you know, like maybe five, seven minutes, you know, and then where are the players that, you know, that don't get any playing time, you know, they raise their hand. And so I'll go from the back end and I'm like, okay, so why don't you play? Why don't you get in the game? You know, and then most of the time they're like, I don't know, you know, I really don't know. And so I, you know, I start asking questions. I'm like, are you one of the best ball handlers on the team? No. Are you one of mm -hmm. the best on the team? No. You know, um, you know, are you are you in the best condition? You know, you play the best defense. And then I'm like, huh, well, that, those are some of the reasons why you're not playing. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that I get kids to, to focus on what Focus on what your control your controllables is what I like to say. Mm. Don't focus on whether the coach puts you in the game or not. If you're not playing, you should be in a gym, you know, getting at least an extra 200 shots, depending on what level you're at, two, three, 400 shots or a, a day, you know, or something. You should be working on ball handling. There's no reason. If you're not playing the game, that means you're getting out of shape every, the only thing you're doing is practicing. So. You know, you're, are you asking the coach, can I watch film just to see, you know, what you would like for me to do? You know, like, can you show me this? Are you asking the coach, you know, can you help me get better in this? Because I do want to play. I'm like, did you come to college to do this? This is what you came for? You know, and it just run old, but you control a lot of things. So that's why I'm really good. I think, you know, just helping players to realize, okay, you decide whether you want to play or not. And you decide and you bring your coaches into it because it teaches you about communication. If you're not happy with the situation, you got to learn how to go to that person and talk to them in a non-confrontational way and just get coach. You know, I, I really want to play. You know, I came here. I had just, you know, dreams to, to be a part of something and, and I want to help. You know, can you help me get better because I do want to play. You know, so, so that's that's who I am and that's what I enjoy more than the X's and O's part. Okay. For me, <laughs> the funnest part of being, because you know, I coach high school basketball and uh, the funnest part to me, you know, the most fun part of it is the expression when they win on their faces. It's, it's like, you know, when you teach and a kid goes, oh, to me, you know, there's nothing better than that, you know, so Whenever they win, especially if your team is not accustomed to winning and they get a win, it really like the, the excitement. That's the part of it that I, I really enjoy. I, I like that part of it, you know, and um, that goes a long way for me, you know. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So as a high school coach, what do you feel some of the reasons are that kids are not developing like they should like why are the why are some teams super strong and then some teams oh much okay know? so that's a good question so this this um vacation right i was at um so you you're familiar with new york right so i was over at um boys and girls high i was working over there now historically they've always been a really good basketball team right them, Lincoln, um, Lachlan used to be in the mix, Christ the King, all these different schools, right? So shortly after school let out, I noticed that the high were having their girls come in and their boys come in and they were training. So what makes a team different than another team is them, like you said earlier, putting in the work. You had these guys in the gym training i'm like hold on school just let out your kids are back already they were like yeah man we're here we, we do summer workouts and things like that and that makes a difference you know so if you put the time in you, you'll have better better um better players you know it's like um i used to box professionally right so the guys that were good fighters 
had a heavy amateur background. We had a lot of experience. And, you know, through experience, you become better. And that's what I think the difference is. I don't think each school is putting in the same amount of work. That's why you got some schools that stand out year after year and some that don't. All right, well, let me tell you what I think it is. I think okay. it's the leadership. I think it's the coaches, the principals. I think it's the leadership of each school. Because my point is, is if you want to have good programs and anything, you will provide the opportunity for kids. The high open up their gym for not only their students, but for my daughter went there and worked out there for several, you know, like through the summer, you know, and stuff because Justin Wright, who trains a lot of the kids, he was there, you know, training kids throughout the year and everything. Mm -hmm. So, so, but I feel like it's it's leadership. Leadership, I feel like they're, I feel like it's not holding kids accountable or making a way for them or giving kids the opportunity to be better, letting them have a choice to show up. Like if we open up our gym, you know, and everything, and then, you know, maybe we'll just get one of the coaches to come through and put the kids through drills, you know, or something okay. like that. You know, like, I feel like those are the reasons kids, how many times, you, you mean, I mean, the, the really focused kids are going to go and they'll, they'll probably go to the, you know, to a court or something and maybe work on a shot or work on something. But most kids, that's, that's like work, you know, and that, that, <laughs> that you know, it, it, it ain't nothing cute about that. But if your coach says, okay, if you're looking to play this year and you're not playing AAU ball, then you need to be in this gym, you know, and stuff like that. And I think the level of, of the sport would raise, especially in New York. You know, and the funniest thing is, is, you know, New York has a stigma, um, you know, and I have a lot of friends that, you know, that played in the WNBA and they are, you know, play D1 collegiately, but they're, they're, they're coaches now, college coaches. Okay. One of, one of my friends was telling me, Ken, you know, we don't really, we don't really recruit heavy in New York because number one, I've heard of them. heavy and the guards can't shoot. They do all the razzle dazzle dribble, you know, and they run and gun. They only have one speed, you know, they don't know how to think the game. You know, they're not in shape, you know, and things like that. So, you know, I just kind of feel like that shows heavy on the coaching, that the culture of coaching, because kids are only an extension of what leadership is. So, okay. I think it's leadership, you know. I think leadership now, needs to say, you know, we got this baseball team has been terrible ever since the school opened. Or, <coughs> Or we have, you know, our, our our girls' basketball team isn't getting any better. And, you know, like, I feel like if it's important enough, you know, three, two, three days a week, open up the gym so kids can work on stuff. You know, provide, you know, open up the, the field so kids can get some batting practice in or, you know, or just something, you know, that have kids, you know, show up and get in shape or, you know, I just feel like leadership is letting kids down and guess what happens? And then the kids now, they want to go to college and the opportunity is not there, and, you know, or when they get to college, some of the kids that get there, it's a culture shock because now the coach has you running, you know, like crazy and, and it's like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I can't do this and you're ready to quit and then you want right. to transfer every time you go and get stuff and it's hard. Because you haven't held kids accountable, you know, to be mentally tough and to push through this. And sports not is more than just a game. You know, I really feel like, you know, when you push them on the court with love, not screaming at them and yelling at them, you know, and degrading them and stuff like that. But even talking to them beforehand, look, this is not personal what I have to say. But I know you guys can get better. You know, I know you, I've, I've talked to you, you know exactly what to do. Your effort is not there, you know. Like whatever, like I just feel we have to change the culture for girls in order for girls. And, and for boys too. I mean, I'm just saying for kids in general. Wow. Okay. So I mean, how would we go about that? How, how would you know? As you, you're saying, it starts from the top. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Athletic directors, principals. Oh, from like the, the AD on down. Okay. The school superintendent. Like you guys have to have satellite. Uh, spots throughout the city where kids that aren't playing AAU ball they can go in and get some training throughout the year and even if it's just like three days a week it'll still be better kids will still come back better you know and just provide opportunities for kids and then have people come in and talk about the mentality being you know going tough you know working hard you know like I just I just 
I just feel like, you know, if, if we want, as adults, we want things to change, we want the kids to be better, we have to provide better examples and we have to provide opportunities for them to get better. You know, it's not like they're just going to go get better on their own. Yeah, we need yeah. to go get better on our own as kids, you know? Yeah, because understood. Our, understood. Parents, we, our parents made us come back and do stuff how many times over if we didn't do it right, you know? Oh, man. I, I remember <laughs> being in, in phonics, taking apart a sentence, you know, <laughs> piece by piece. You know, I remember those days, but they don't do that anymore. They don't teach, you know, penmanship anymore, things like that. So, well, man, that that's going to be a, a, a big ask because, you know, sometimes you get people in, in, in positions that they don't, they're not as passionate about how the kids are performing as you might be as an athlete or myself as an athlete, you know, so you're fighting uphill with that, you know, go ahead. But, but this is how you have to say it. You have to let them know that when kids are motivated, now it might be motivation coming from sport, but mm -hmm. when they're motivated in sport, then that motivates their academics. And when kids are academically motivated, they do better. That reflects on the school. That reflects on the, you know, on the whole league that you're playing in. When mm -hmm. all of a sudden your students, because they're athletes, are they're doing things that they love, Mm -hmm. And they're getting better, and then they know they have to maintain a particular GPA, and they have to do their work. That's a win-win across the board. Mm. Well, you you can't. Well, you well know you can't play PSAL ball without you know maintaining a certain GPA, and you know you can't be failing a certain amount of classes and things like that. And I, I think too, another piece of that is that a lot of kids in my in my opinion in my humble opinion i think a lot of them believe they can get better or or think they, they can be better if they're good at a video game like the thinking is they can play a video game and they honestly believe that on the court i i'm this good as the video game i'm like no that's not how it works you know so that that's another thing too that the tech the tech plays a part in it too i think you know and you know, that this again speaks to my point of providing opportunities so kids can get in the gym and say, if you want to shoot as good as you shoot on the video game, mm -hmm. you got to put shots up in the gym to make it happen in real life. Yeah, they don't, they don't, some, some children don't, they don't, they actually believe that because they're good at the game. They, it, sometimes for some kids, it just doesn't transfer. And, you know, I, I don't know why that is. You know, I, I guess, you know, I, I don't know. That one, I don't know. You know, so Kim, I, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and coming on. Uh, you're the very first guest ever on my podcast, and I thank you for coming through. <laughs> and uh, you were awesome as always. You got any shout outs you want to send to anybody while you're on? Uh, no, I just want to look shout out everybody there in New York. You know, do better, be better. Uh, I just provide opportunities for the young people coming up and uh, you know just kind of help them because you know i look at you know they're so heavily influenced by by social media and and things like that i still Big time. Having, Big time. having yeah having outs um to to exercise and to move and to do other things, you know, or just give themselves a break from that. I think those things are super important. But I just think um, just being connected as people, I think we just need to do a better job of being connected as people. Okay. Now, think, you know, and I think, you know, and I think everybody who's in the world of basketball there, I, I really feel like everybody really needs to reevaluate their reasoning. Why are you coaching? Are you really improving the lives of these kids or are you um, just in it for the accolades that you might get? Or, you know, like, I just feel like we can all do better. So I'm, I'm just- Yeah, I agree. Together. I agree. I agree. I, I believe also we can be a little more patient with our youth. Yep. I, I believe we can be a little more patient with them because your expectation, they, they may not be able to deliver what your expectation of them is. And you gotta, exactly. you gotta be patient with that. And common sense ain't so common. Facts. You know? Because when you think about it, when we Facts. grew up, 
we had our parents, we had uh, our grandparents, and every, you know, we had people pouring into us, teaching us how to sew a button back on, back of him, you know, teaching you how to clean up and how to cook, you know, and when these kids, they haven't had people pouring in, you know, they haven't had a lot of people pouring into them. So that's what they need. They need guidance, you know, in a loving manner, in a, in a, in a way that's consistent. Yeah, and as, as a coach, if they don't have that, then as you're working with them, you're, you're trying to undo all of those issues in a two and a half or three hour practice. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's hard to do. Yep. That's really hard to do. Yep. So Kim, thanks again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Miss Kim Hampton. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're watching this show, after you get through watching it, tell somebody else to watch it. Okay. Thank you for watching this episode. Tonight's music was brought to you by Chocolate Steel. And uh, that's all we got for now. Thank you. All right, Kim, I'll talk to you. All right, bye-bye. All right, bye.